Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the post lunch session of Marketing BIMM Symposium 2021. We, Sanket Hivan and Malvika Chauhan, student managers, Balaji Institute of Modern Management BIMM, will be the masters of ceremony for today's function. It's indeed been a festival of knowledge. Today's learning and listening to distinguished business leaders representing Globewester, Oyo India and South Asia, and Ergos India, sir. All the activities at Sri Balaji University Pune are coordinated and executed by the student managers. We give guidance from their faculty mentors. The student managers are put through rigorous learning culture, from academic sessions to workshops, case studies, management games, and guest lectures. All the all this contributes to overall the growth and development of the student managers. So. We humbly wish to submit that in the virtual mode also we celebrate all major landmarks such as Teachers Day, Hindi Divas, birthdays of our fellow batchmates, National Sports Day, International Day for Peace and Nonviolence, just to name a few. So, as a part of safety measures and being a socially conscious organization, we have carried out COVID vaccination drive and testing drive for student managers and staff members of SBU. The theme of this year's marketing symposium is insight innovation and ingenuity. Marketing and business development depends on growth connections. The successful marketeers will be the ones who will connect with their teams, lead leaders, ecosystems, customers. Thus, they will redefine marketing's role in leading digital business, drive new revenue growth with digital tools and techniques, deliver customer experience that improves growth. These are the lessons that we are all going to learn from the thought leaders. May I now call upon student manager Nayan Gupta to deliver the welcome address. Over to you, Nayan. Thank you, Malvika. A very good afternoon to all the dignitaries present here. Welcome to Marketing Symposium 2021, organized by Balaji Institute of Modern Management, BIMF Pune. I, Nayan Gupta, a student manager Sri Balaji Institute of Modern Management is honored to deliver the welcome address. With the blessings of our Founder Chancellor, Professor Dr. Colonel A. Bala Subramaniam Sir, whom we lovingly call Bala Sir, and on behalf of all the student managers of Balaji Institute of Modern Management, I would like to extend a warm welcome to all the dignitaries, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. G. K. Shude Sir, Prof. Pro Chancellor and Director of Finance, Professor B. Paramanan Sir, Senior Director and Dean Corporate Relations, Dr. Dimple Sani Madam, Senior Director and Dean IT and Admission, Dr. Biju Pillai Sir, all the directors of Institute, Deputy Directors, Faculty Members, Parents, and all my fellow student managers. Balaji Institute of Modern Management is the flagship institute of Sri Balaji University, Pune, BIMM has been organizing the marketing symposium, inviting thought leaders from different sectors to congregate and share their thoughts on various topics and new advancements in the industry. The symposium will reflect on how the marketing world has changed or not, and where we see it moving in the coming years. COVID-19 has catalyzed how marketers and all of us must leverage technology in all aspects of business and day-to-day -day life. We should also be pondering on what changes are here to stay and also understand ways to tackle various challenges in the ever-changing volatile business environment. BIMM Marketing Symposium 2021 celebrates the spirit of problems are opportunity, the mantra given by our beloved Balasar, the theme for this year, Marketing Symposium is Insights, Innovation, and Ingenuity. We have a great lineup of speakers representing organizations like Globester, Oyo India, and South Asia, and Argos India. We are sure we will have a great learning experience throughout the day from our distinguished thought leaders. The key to success is to focus on goals, not obstacles. At Sri Balaji University Pune, we embrace change, welcome challenges, and look for opportunities in every situation to learn and grow in wisdom. 
On behalf of all the student managers, I wholeheartedly welcome you to the Marketing Symposium 2021 organized by Balaji Institute of Modern Management (BIM). Thank you. Over to you, Malvika. Thank you, Nayan. May I now request Dr. Archana Shivastava, Director BIM, to welcome our guest, Ankur Shivastava, sir. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back after the lunch session. So I'm really honored to welcome another jewel in the BIM Marketing Symposium today. I am delighted to welcome an astute professional, Mr. Ankur Shivastava, co-founder and VP. Globe Vesta is also an entrepreneur and an angel investor. On behalf of Sri Balaji University, I extend a very warm welcome to you, and we are keenly waiting to listen from you. Great, thank you so much, ma'am, and I thank all the students also for inviting me, giving me this opportunity to talk to you guys. Uncle sir, uh, Uncle yeah. sir, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, yes, uh, the computers will just invite you, sir. Just one minute, sir. I'm okay, so sorry. Okay, perfect. That's yeah, fine. so they would uh, want to read out your very illustrious profile for the benefit of the audience. So after that, all right. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. May I now request student manager Ankita Dhyani to introduce Ankur Shivastav, sir, to the audience. Over to you, Ankita. Thank you, Malvika. It is rightly said by your Burnett. Make it simple, make it memorable, make it inviting to look at, make it fun to read. A very good afternoon to all the dignitaries present here. I, Ankita Dhyani, student manager of Balaji Institute of Modern Management (BIMM), Sri Balaji University, Pune, take great privilege to introduce our guest speaker, Mr. Ankur Shrivastava. Sir, so is the co-founder and vice president at Glowvesto, a startup in the venture investing space. Sir is also an entrepreneur in VC industry, running a tech investment platform and own micro VC funds to invest in early stage startups in the US and India for the past seven years of prior experience in management consulting. Sir is a seed stage investor in about 35 startups, including Zoomka, Springboard, Printobox, Busybrex, Doxbo, and etc. Investors in Glowvestor include some of the most well-known global VC and angel investors, including Tim Draper, Boost VC, and Bill Draper. As an early-stage investor at Glowvestor, Sir has written close to 60 checks in about 35 deals. These investments span a variety of sectors, including transport, edtech, health tech, fintech, consumer, and clean tech. He is a sector agnostic in his investment thesis and is currently involved with the boards of Flinterbox, BRB, Toolbox, and Grovesto. So previously have nearly a decade of experience in statistic, decision-making, and management consulting at BCG and SDG. Apart from this, consulting experience in Asia and Africa spread across diverse industries, including pharma, banking, finance, infrastructure, and agribusiness sectors. Sir graduated from IIT Bombay in 2004 with a graduate and postgraduate degree in mechanical engineering. Sir has been honored with Charles Fu Award for Outstanding Client Impact and Best Team Award for Client Delivery. Today, we have a great opportunity to interact with you, sir, and hear your thoughts. And this will surely encourage us in our future events. It's an honor to have you here. We welcome you, sir. The platform is all yours. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Ankita. Uh, uh, and I spoke out of turn, but I guess it's now my turn. So thank you, everyone, for inviting me and giving me this opportunity. Um, I think it's exciting to speak to young students. And uh, I think the topic that I wanted to sort of speak to you guys today is more about something that I do, which is angel investing or venture capital, right? And how it impacts all of us as students and marketers. So I have a brief presentation to talk to you about trends in angel investing. And then maybe we just uh, speak a little bit about how that impacts you guys as marketers or as students or early talent that's entering the uh, industry. Right? So let me quickly share my screen.
please let me know if you can see it, yeah? Yeah, visible. Okay, perfect, great. So today, uh, you know, I want to talk to you, talk to you all a little bit about uh, what is to lay the lay the foundation or lay the lay the, uh, lay the discussion. What is what does a VC or an angel investor do? Right today, we hear everywhere a lot of investment is happening. A lot of early stage startups are getting founded. I think it's much more than I started about seven years ago. Uh, at that time, it was almost a a buyer's market today it's almost a seller's market so the so the um, the ecosystem has really really exploded in the last few years and in the last 12 months itself you've seen it again balloon 2x or 3x right so a lot of activity is happening and we as young uh, students you would hear a lot about we see angel investments etc happening i want to talk to you a little bit about what are the trends what does a vc do right but I guess what we should probably start with is the fact that the angels and VCs um, typically are financing something that the other sources of financing would not finance, right? Which is a very high risk, high return asset profile. If you look at the left graph, this slide is really talking about the portfolio of, of an of a angel investor or a venture capitalist. Now, when we go in, when we invest in any any portfolio we're looking at if you look at the pie chart on the left we are saying almost 40 to 50 percent of our startups will actually fail that's the kind of investment uh, thesis that goes in which typically if you invest in stocks etc you would hardly ever sort of expect or real estate anything to go to zero so angel investing is really about managing a lot of failures almost half of our companies would fail but if you wouldn't know that uh, when we're entering and then again, there would be some modest successes, which would be 30, 40% of the profile, uh, a percent of the portfolio. And there are very few home runs that typically we will have, 10 to 20%, right? And these home runs would really, really decide the overall return of the portfolio. So this is the sort of risk profile that, that is there. But at the same time, the reward profile is also very high. So when you look at these home runs, they could be 5X, 10X, they could be 2000X, who knows? So that is the that is the hope with which uh, the investment is made. That the multi baggers are really really big multi baggers, which cover up for all the failures and then give us a return. Right? So that's the um, that's the mentality of an angel investor. Now, if you look at the chart on the right, that's the typically financing cycle for any um, tech startup. You know, right? Uh, that is the 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 blue line really represents the cash flows. Usually. Any startup will go through multiple rounds of financing. I think you guys must be fairly aware of this uh, through the media articles already, right? That companies are raising pre-seed, seed, series A, and larger and larger these days. Now, usually this is almost a more dated graph where the x-axis is, is right at the bottom, right? Now, if, as more and more capital has been infused into the ecosystem, the the ability for startups to remain in negative cash flows has, has increased multifold. So you would see now startups which are, um, which are have which have negative cash flows up to series C, series D, or even more, right? almost like you as well. But the way angels and early VCs invest is they focus on the pre-seed seed series A stage, right? Remaining asset for five to seven, eight years, and then exit either through a secondary sale in a later stage or through an IPO. Right? Now that's the um, typical path. For, for a financing part for a startup and different profile of investors invest in different junctures. Now what's happening is at early on, almost in the pre-seed or seed round, you would have individual or HNIs investing. And over time, institutional capital will come in, there will be VCs and over time, it will become private equity funds and even mutual funds these days. Right? Um, very large funds are being raised. And the, this is how the financing goes. Now, given this risk return profile, and this is the kind of sort of cash profile that startups have. Now, what's happening in, um, sorry. And if you look at the. It's now the PPT is moved.
e-commerce sales. The second chart shows how the e-commerce sales are growing as a share of the total retail sales. There's uh, the right. The chart on the right basically charts the top 10 companies, the public companies um, across the world by the market cap uh, every five year increments, right? So you look at starting at 2000, 2005, 2010. And the ones in green are really tech light companies. And the ones in blue are more non tech, you can say traditional companies. So if you look at the 2000 column, uh, you have GE, Entity Docomo, Cisco, et cetera, right? Which are typically uh, more traditional retail, telecom, uh, copper, conglomerate sort of companies. While if you look at right at 2020, you'll see all of the companies that are the highest value creators are now tech led, right? Microsoft, Apple, Amazon. Now, what this means is that over time, technology companies have been able to create massive value for investors, and it's and they are becoming more and more more um, powerful in the in the uh, in the equity stocks and the overall ecosystem as well. Right? Now, what that means for us is um, that even blue chip companies are getting disrupted rapidly by tech upstarts. So, if you look at the chart on the left. Uh, there is Uber, Airbnb, Electronic Arts, you all know about them, Amazon, YouTube. The, I think this is slightly dated, maybe a few months ago, the value that is listed there, 100 billion, 100 billion for Airbnb, Uber. Uh, but what it means is that if you look at Airbus and Ford, these are massive companies that have been around for decades, but they have been disrupted or more value has been created by Uber in almost 10, 15 years itself. Similarly, Airbnb, Hyatt, Hilton, et cetera, um, been around for decades. And something that is very young, 10, 15 year old, is being able to create that sort of value, which is over and above these companies, right? which are almost institutions, long term institutions. Now, what this means is that no sector today is almost um, shielded from the disruption by tech. And that is visible overall in, on the averages as well. The left is more anecdotal in nature. But if you look at the right chart, uh, that is the average company lifespan on the S&P index, right? So if you look at the uh, chart, which is like a rolling seven-year average, the the time, the number of years that a company stays on on the S&P index is gradually decreasing, right? If you look at in the 1980s, it was almost 35 years, and it's come down to almost 15 years, or expected to be come down to 15 years in 2025, which means that the companies are, across sectors are getting disrupted but they're also getting disrupted faster and faster. And that can only happen through technology banks, right? So that is why this tech startups, tech technology startup boom has happened. And that is very evident across all sectors. Now, what this means also is that uh, they are creating massive value for investors. However, if you look at this chart, uh, what is happening these days is that uh, the companies are going public much later. And as a result of this, uh, if you look at the left four or five charts, the bars in bars in blue represent what is their public public market multiple, which is what is the kind of multiple that they have returned to investors after they went public. And the green part of the chart of the bar is the kind of multiple that these companies were able to give to the private market investors who came in prior to the IPO, which is very early on they invested. And, and exited probably at the IPO, right? So if you look at the companies that were started three, four decades ago, Apple, Microsoft, RFP, the distribution of uh, value that was created for investors in public market and private market was fairly well distributed, right? And over time, it has gone really, really down. And now if you look at companies that have started in the last 10, 15 years or so, almost the entire value distribution has happened come to the private markets, which means that if I'm a, a, private, uh, a public market investor and I want to invest in, LinkedIn, in, in technology stocks and create the same sort of value, uh, that is not available to me anymore, right? So Apple gave almost 600x, let's say, uh, there's some calculation to do 600x to uh, private market investors and about 400x to public market investors. But if you look at Twitter, that probably has been 10, 20x only, right? Which is one of the more successful companies. Similarly, Facebook. Now this chart, of course, is slightly dated, maybe six months um, um, or so, 
But even then, I think the larger point being the same that the return multiples in technology stocks has has really gone to the private market. So in the previous slide, but the point I wanted to make was that any savvy investor who's creating a portfolio of investment right necessarily needs to have technology stocks in their portfolio because technology stocks, technology companies are really really disrupting all all aspects of our lives, all sort of sector, right? So having technology stocks in your portfolio is very important. But at the same time, uh, what is happening now in this chart is that you can't wait for these tech companies to go public anymore because that's not the, not the kind of multiples that are being being delivered anymore. So and hence, what it means is that a lot of investors are now investing in private companies, private tech companies, right? Which was not the trend maybe 15 years ago or so. So hence, a lot of large institutions started, a lot of mutual fund companies started to sort of directly invest in startups, while earlier they would typically invest in VC funds that would invest in, invest in startups in turn. And trickle-down effect is that um, people like you and me can also angel invest today very early uh, compared to when we would typically would want to do it. Right? And that is happening across the globe. So angel investing is really, really, really coming into the world and it is becoming part of the portfolio strategy for a lot of people. Now, this one is sort of adding to the, to the overall point. If you look at the, uh, the first chart, which is the average age at IPO for a, for a US tech firm, in 99, when just before the dot-com bubble, it was four years. So companies were going public within four years. In 2014, it had ballooned to almost 11 years. And I, my sense is that in 2021, it will be even more. So because companies can now remain private for much, much longer, there's a lot of capital available. What is also happening is the uh, second chart, right? Which is you hear a lot about unicorns. I think you would have all read how many unicorns have been minted in this year itself in India. Right? And that is the second chart, which is that companies, a percentage of privately held companies which, which were almost unicorn status, right, among private companies has steadily grown. A decade and a half ago, it was less than 1%, right? Almost a decade ago, it was less than 1%. In 2015, it quickly ballooned to 40%. What that means is that of all the companies that are valued at more than a billion dollars, almost 40% were still privately held. And my sense is in 2021, it will be even more. So a lot of this value creation is happening in the private markets. In India, if you look at the right chart, India, uh, the, the first four bars, Infosys, Wipro, Hero, Sipla, there is some calculation around their stock performance post their IPO, right? So Infosys has given probably almost 2,000 X if you count all the dividends and the stock splits, et cetera. So there's between 91 to 2013 or so in 20 years, 22 years or so, a pub, sorry, public multiple. multiple. Uh, but the same thing, now if you look at Zomato, this is again slightly dated, uh, Zomato PDM about all again um, ballooned up in the last year or so, but they have returned the same sort of multiple in India also, what Infosys did, right? And Infosys is the almost the gold standard of success in public markets. The same sort of success has happened for uh, in some other companies in India post that, um, but those are all still privately held except probably Zomato, which is just gone public, right? So what this means is that this is not a US trend only, which is that value creation is shifting to private markets. This is a global trend. Even in India, this has happened, right? So now the question could be that while this is all fine, but now from here on, can Zomato or Paytm or Ola give the kind of returns that Infosys gave uh, for Saipio? Can then is there a further 2000X or 1000X available uh, for public market investors from here on? So if you explore that question, then you come to this graph, which is on the left side, this is the kind of market cap needed in the US to deliver Microsoft-like post IPO returns. So if I look at almost 2000X or so, um, uh, for Facebook to deliver, it will have to grow so much in value that we have to sort of grow above the nominal US GDP, which is crazy, right? Similarly for Twitter, LinkedIn, Snap, et cetera, to deliver the same kind of returns, they have to be almost a sizable portion of the US GDP. 
in India, the picture is even more stark. If we expect Zomato or say Flipkart, et cetera, to give that sort of value that Infosys gave in public markets, uh, the companies, the value of these companies have to be in trillions to grow to trillions. So it's safe to say that that kind of returns are now not available in the public markets. Uh, and hence, a lot of investment now happens in the in private markets. Now, the other point I wanted to make is that this is, uh, while we looked at the US and India picture, uh, overall emerging markets are coming into, in, into their own right. So the wealth being created by emerging markets, if you look at the left chart, is growing very, very steadily. So from 20% in 2000, as a share of global GDP in 2025, expected to almost grow to 40%, almost double the share. And that is also reflected in the unicorns that are being created, right? Now, almost a decade ago, it was impossible to imagine that there will be more, more unicorns are, uh, out of the Silicon Valley than in it, right? Which is, but it's already happened, right? So out of all the, all the unicorns that were, that existed as of maybe early this year, April 2021, more than half were outside of the US. So China had 133, India and Israel together at 51, and India would have ballooned a lot already. Mm. So the value that is getting created by tech startups is global. I think we all know it, we all see it, but these are the data sort of further elaborate the point. Now, what this means, right? overall as a trend is that angel investing has almost become a norm and that is globally. So investors want to invest in technology companies, else they're losing out on portfolio value, but waiting till IPO to enter technology stocks is not working anymore. Therefore investing in tech companies early when they're private is becoming a norm. And this is reflected in statements by Andy Singh Horowitz, Wench Pete, everyone, right? That more and more bigger institutions are now, now coming in investing in startups. And you look at SoftBank, you look at Tiger Global, and you wonder why all this is happening. And those are the prevailing reasons or preemptive reasons for why all this activity is happening in the private markets these days, right? And the impact of that is that um, this has impact, this has implications on us as consumers, as students who are sort of looking at, looking at uh, long careers as well as for me, somebody who's in the finance domain or you, some of you who would join the finance domain, right? Uh, there are implications for all of us. Huh? But to summarize, huh, these are the trends in angel investing, if you will, to take home, which is, again, tech companies are increasingly, increasingly creating the most value, becoming the uh, most value creating businesses in the long term globally. And all investors need to have tech stocks. Huh? But there is a lot of private market wealth, so companies are staying private for longer and longer. And post-IPO returns of these companies is not matching up to their pre-IPO returns anymore. And hence, more and more investors have started to sort of get exposed to early stage private health tech companies. And hence, angel investing is becoming a norm globally. And then the other thing is that this is a global phenomenon. It's not just limited to the US anymore, or maybe not just India, but it's, it's happening in Latin America, Southeast Asia, Bangladesh. Nowadays, uh, new tech companies are coming up. I know friends who are starting up funds in Pakistan. So there are this uh, activity is very, very global. Now, this is what I had in terms of showing you guys uh, what the trends are, right? But I think uh, if I now look at what it means for you, as let's say marketers, right? In India, what is happening is that there are three broad trends. I don't have a slide on it, but I'll just talk through it, which is first is that the power of Indian consumers is really, really on the rise. And you look at, and you, that is evident in the, in the growth of companies like Zomato, Swiggy, or Paytm, right? Where as marketers, you're directly targeting the, the consumers much more than before. But the fact that these are all tech-driven driven companies and you're going direct to direct to direct to those consumers marketing them is mean it means for you is that there's instant feedback. There's a lot of fail fast approach that can be taken. So that is one theme for marketers that the power of Indian consumers is on the rise. You look at so many D2C brands that are now popping up, and that is one area, very big area that a lot of startups and funds are now focusing on. The other is that there is a big trend of uh, creating startups from India 
for the world. So a lot of SaaS companies, which are sitting here in India, they have their offices, tech offices, even inside marketing offices in India and selling to the world, right? You have very high, big success stories like Freshtest just IPO'd on Nasdaq, you have Zoho, you have Chargebee, and a bunch of other companies. Chennai and Bangalore are becoming big SaaS hubs as well. Right? But that is a very, very different sort of marketing, right? This is ta targeting uh, consumers and businesses uh, outside of India, sitting here in India, being able to sort of successfully sell, uh, which is a lot of inside sales, inside marketing uh, that you sort of need to do. That's the second trend, the kind of companies that, uh, that are popping up in India. And the third one is that there is sort of realization that the Indian MSME or SMB is also not far behind. So you look at companies that are getting created, which are selling software or SaaS or some sort of um, uh, software to these Kirana stores or very small SMEs or small factories like there is Khatabur, there is OK Credit and, and many others. Right? So these are the kind of three things that are being explored in, in the ecosystem right now, which is making stuff for Indian consumers. Uh, and the question there is, will the Indian consumer pay? Uh, that is a risk that some of the companies are taking, some of the companies are more transactional in nature, where the uh, unit economics or the revenue model is fairly well established. The second is, can we build world beating products from India? And it's happening again uh, more and more. And the reason for that is that why, why SaaS, et cetera, is, is coming up from India is that we've had a long history of very successful IT services companies, right? Which know, which have sort of understood how to deal with uh, global clients, what their pain points are, and have a very good sales experience in, in those industries. So now all that talent is being roped in by, by SaaS companies as well, or companies that are building out of India, product companies, I should say, not just SaaS, product companies out of India to sell to the world. And through the, through the experience of the last decade and a half in engineering and product, which is from say large companies like Flipkart, Zomato, Paytm, et cetera, there's a lot of engineering and product talent. So when these two meet together, you can actually build companies, big companies, and big success stories from India and sell to the world. Right? So that is a big trend that is happening. And the third is, again, the question is, there is a lot of software adoption with, among the Indian SMEs and SMBs as well. Uh, the question again there is for us in front of investors and startups is whether these SMBs will be able to pay and whether they're the right uh, unit economics will emerge. Right? So now that is the trend as, as marketers. So these are the three sort of um, uh, segments of, or, or personas that you can, can target as marketers. As far as being talented individuals who sort of join the workforce very soon probably, uh, there is this key trend, right? Which is that technology companies are a are, are huge state and more and more job creation is happening there. So whatever sector you join, there will be either an external tech company that will come and disrupt it or internally, there'll be more and more tech adoption there, right? So, so when you look at your careers, when you look at your uh, future, then uh, just aligning itself from what is happening by the disruption of tech across sectors uh, would probably be a, uh, put you in good stead as well. Right? So those are the two implications in a way that I sort of wanted to share and share these trends in angel investing. I don't know how we're doing on time, uh, but this is broadly what I had. Uh, so, uh, so I'll stop here and then let you guys uh, funnel this. Thank you, sir. Sorry, uh, yeah. I don't know. It was very, it was very um, theoretical or boring for you guys, but I thought I'll share something that I do and something that I'm excited about and uh, the trends that I'm excited about, and maybe there is some takeaway for all of you in it. No, on the contrary, I think we got to know a different perspective today. So thank you for uh, letting us know that a different side. You know what investors do, what do they think about, and all of that. So pretty interesting and different. Yeah, when I started almost. Seven years ago, I think these were the trends that were very, very early. Uh, and we had sort of, when we started Globester, I'll talk a little bit about what we did as well uh, and how it is very different now. Is that when we started Globester, I think the idea was there is a lot of activity.
activity happening in India. This was late 2013. A uh, lot of activity happening in India uh, in, in the startup uh, ecosystem. But there were not enough angel investors, early investors available in India at that point of time. The pyramid was not really a pyramid at all, almost like cylinder in terms of early stage investors and VCs, et cetera, right? Uh, but we had a lot of people globally, uh, angel investors who wanted to sort of invest in India. And we put that two and two together and we said that we'll become the facilitator of uh, foreign investment, angel investment into India. And that is the trend that we started with. But over time, we realized that, uh, that there is a lot of money or angel investment um, uh, enthusiasm that is available in India is, itself. And you see that now in the market, right? So we have also grown and evolved with that thesis, um, but but over time it has really uh, evolved in front of our eyes, which is that from a lot of foreign capital that was uh, for, uh, sort of spurring on the early stage tech activity, now it is all a lot of domestic capital as well. Thank you, sir. We really love the intuitive uh, data that you shared with us and the uh, knowledge. Uh, so now may I request Dr. Archana Srivastava, Director of BMM, to moderate the Q&A session. Yeah, thank you, Malvika. So, um, Shankar, if you allow me, I'll just post some of the questions which the students have asked. So sure. the, the very first uh, question is uh, about Agnikul. So Agnikul, the Indian space startup became the right. first company to sign an NDA with ISRO after the Indian government opened the space sector in 2020. And Globevestor was one of the investors in the startup. So what convinced you to go ahead and seed this project? It's very, very interesting. So, uh, so in 2013, when we, I was in the, in the Valley for early 2014, we had these 3D printed rocket startups. We came across them, uh, one of them there. And we thought this is crazy, right? What is this guy attempting? Uh, there are big behemoths like SpaceX, etc. Uh, in 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 already sort of there. But the trend that we saw was that um, there is uh, the uh, the geospatial mapping in a way, right? There is a lot of need for new satellites and new information now across the world, right? And the uh, so I think whenever we invest, I think uh, what we have to see is what is the specific problem that that company is solving. And we had seen this trend come up globally, which is that a lot of new information needs to be sort of um, created from satellites. It could be topology data, it could be um, uh, weather data, it could be anything, right? A lot of it, um, uh, roads or whatnot, right? But what was happening was all these rockets, right? All these rockets that were available to take these small satellites and satellites had become very miniaturized. We call them CubeSats now, which is like, once, whatever, one centimeter by one centimeter sort of cuboid, right? Which are so small satellites, which are getting launched now, but they then cannot wait for such a huge 100 meter or 200 meter sort of rocket to take them to space where it becomes cost prohibitive for, for that rocket launcher to, 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 uh, to take these small satellites. So we thought there will be a miniaturization of even the launch vehicles also. And uh, this is something that is being adopted across the globe. Uh, but Agnikul was one of those companies that uh, that came up in our radar really early. But I think the big question for us was, it's great uh, for all this to happen in the US where the regulations are much more permitting, but what about India, right? It's so regulated. But I think we're very, very happily surprised by, or uh, yeah, happily surprised by how ISRO and other space agencies have sort of taken this in India, opened up or, the scientists are almost mentors to our to these founders, and uh, a lot of people they are having regular review sessions with them and so on. So there is so much collaboration, which I actually don't see in any other sector. Probably the space sector is just just um, 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 pushing this. Uh, the space uh, the regulators are just pushing it into the different territories. So I think what convinced us was that the, the problem is really really acute. The technologies or the launch vehicles that are sending these miniature cube sites are almost two decades old that are sending. So this is just a big, big uh, problem that needs to get solved. And India, right, has that talent because India has proven to be able to sort of do this in a very, very cost-effective way. There's a lot of talent in India and that can be um, uh, tapped by the private sector and, uh, and become one of the big players. We are already a big player from a government aspect in space, but can the private sector also become, we thought it's, it's, probably possible. 
uh, but Agnikul's rocket still has to fly. So uh, we are waiting for that to happen next year. I think that is a, our big binary event that will happen. So let us see, fingers crossed. And I uh, hope you all wish good luck to them as well. Same here. We would also wish all the very best for this uh, startup and of course for your company since you all have invested into it. And good news for talent in India. It's getting recognized and it is having all these, you know, enabling infrastructures and investors like you all. Uh, the next question is, um, which particular decision to seed a project or startup you are most proud about? Well, I think uh, there is this company called, uh, which is typically not a very, very VC path. Uh, the startup that does not typically go through a VC path is called Chakra Innovation. Uh, it's a clean tech company. And uh, I was giving a lecture in IIT Delhi and these kids had come to sort of listen to that, so that, to that lecture. And after that event, they sort of stood by and then we had a chat and they said, we're starting this new company, which will, we're, uh, we figured out a way to sort of um, suck out all the pollution from the diesel generators and convert it into ink, right? And that's novel in the world and not happened anywhere else. And uh, basically they're creating this retrofit device, which they can go and install on any diesel generator anywhere in India. And uh, it will just suck out almost 90% of the pollution. So all the problem that we had in Delhi, and this was almost in the winter time when Delhi was just struggling with bad air quality. So that really struck me that this is something that's probably very innovative. But these were kids in college who had not even graduated, right? So, uh, so that was a big risk on whether they can even sell. This was an enterprise product, not a consumer product. You have to go and sell to PSUs, to large um, uh, enterprise customers to sort of take on this green approach. Um, but they stuck to their guns. And they raised multiple rounds of funding. And now one round of funding is series B is almost happening right now. Um, but they have uh, been able to sort of prove all our apprehensions wrong. They have grown in sales a lot. They have innovated continuously. And uh, um, they have reduced the size of their overall device to much smaller. So everybody is much more uh, um, sort of uh, receptive. All the clients are much more receptive to their person. And at the same time, they've been able to sort of work with the with the uh, pollution control boards to sort of come out with uh, push these companies to sort of adopt cleaner uh, emission norms, etc. Right. So they've been able to sort of work through multiple multiple um, work streams uh, where different skills are involved, a young set of students. But the most important thing that excites me or um, I find satisfaction in is that is a positive impact company. Right. Why it's growing, it's growing, and um, uh, creating in value into something which is more, uh, we worry for our kids as well, right? All the daily air pollution, et cetera, and it's creating some impact there. So I'm really proud of that company in specific, although um, my investors might say that that's not the typical VC funded part, that, but I feel very proud of that. Uh, the next question is what factors influence valuation of startups? Uh, this is a question that founders often ask, right? How do I value my company? Right? And I think the answer to that is that it's more art than science at the stage that we invest, in, right? Because there are no benchmarks available. A lot of the companies that that are that that we fund are very innovative in nature. So there are no public market companies that you can say benchmark to and say that this is 10x of earnings or whatnot. Um, uh, and then there are no earnings at that point of time, right? So how do you even use the right multiples? That is one. So you can't use that multiples or comparative approach. At the other end, there is no, um, the projections, uh, typically in a private equity firm, you'll do discounted cash flow valuation or something like that. That again is very tough to do because projections are anybody's guess, right? I could take a 10x growth or a 5x growth. Um, uh, it's all assumptions right? and at the early stage that we come in. So, so what does impact then is that we don't have benchmarks. We can't really... Um, really bank on the projections uh, what then uh, what then the way we value is we look at the potential of the idea right and the typical benchmarks so a company has to go through multiple rounds of financing and there is a certain level of expectation from investors on how much percentage ownership each of them will take right? so it's a almost like a triaging a triangulation of how much does the startup really need for the next 18 to 24 months and hence how much should they raise 
typically how much should they um, um, dilute at that early stage of the company at the like at the other end how much does the investor want in terms of uh, uh, control in terms of rights in terms of ownership and the third is what is the kind of potential this company has so and what is the team how successful is it what is the um uh, sort of execution potential have they proven it in some fashion through their academic careers or through professional or in this repeat entrepreneur so all these things go in but eventually honestly it's it's more uh, unstructured approach than really really very very structured approach. and i think i'm talking about early stage if the question is more about late stage and uh, the problem is that uh, because these companies a lot of these companies are still not making positive cash flows a lot of these things have to sort of carry on now uh, as well right because you can't have earning multiples etc um yeah so i think uh, it's more art than science right. so next one is um, uh, rejection of failure rate is very high in this line of work what would be your mm-hmm. advice to budding entrepreneurs particularly budding student entrepreneurs right uh i think two or three things i would say one is that uh, think through from a very problem um, orientation right i mean are you really solving a big problem right? a lot of times uh, students uh, or uh, anyone right um, it's a startup is a almost a new new territory right so even 10 year two decade old professionals when they start they're all as green as as probably a student but i think the key thing is that uh, anyone who's solving um, who's creating a startup because they think it's cool or what not i think and there is not a very very strong problem at the customer's end then that somehow runs into trouble very soon so i would say focus completely on the customer does the customer really want the solution or does do they really have a very very acute problem that you solve if it's a very very minor problem that is good to have solution that do those things uh, don't scale as well right that's the first one. customer orientation and thinking from the customer standpoint there has to be a very very acute problem the second is uh, the team that you build has to somehow you have to sort of uh, think through that the solution that you're building what are the various capabilities and skills that you need and have a very very well rounded co-founding team because you your ability to sort of attract talent and pay or uh, hire them is very very low early on so as much as you can sort of um uh, um round up all those skills within the founding team itself that is very valuable then you're not dependent on anyone else you can just um as one of the uh, uh, well known investors uh, founder why combinator he says ramen pro- profitability right which is that can the team just survive on in india's term maggi um all time right and then still deliver right so without very very low cost that's the second a third which i usually tell everyone which is financial viability you know right if as students you have to really take care of your family earning is required etc and what not then you have to come to a point where your your personal financial situation does not come into the picture for almost 4 to 5 years because it's a long term game and success is while we see um, um uh, overnight success but they take a lot of time to sort of develop so even to experienced entrepreneurs or younger ones i would say that if you have some sort of a plan b uh for at least four five years have that financial viability so that you don't come under that pressure within a year six months or so because you won't be able to pay yourself the salary right so have a customer oriented approach have all the skills in the team itself and then ensure that you don't need to sort of uh draw on uh, cash for a long while or a significant cash for a long while if those th- three things you can manage i think there will be enough opportunity that you'll be solving a customer's problem you'll have enough time to pivot and then um, sort of change your solution change your approach and have that team that sort of sticks around with you and is capable to do it themselves i uh, will take the last question and it's not so much from your work but it's a bit personal and it says that uh, as a person how do you define success what does success mean to you well it's changed over time right uh, as does for everyone right when i was young and i was my when i was in college i was like i need to be in the best consulting firm i want to be a consultant right then when i was in bcg it was um, maybe i need to be much more closer to the problem right because as a strategy consultant you would give them 5 to 10 years of strategy but then you won't be around to see whether how that how that uh, 
uh, you know how how did it uh, come to fruition whether it was successful or not and then um, so so vc was almost my way of coming closer to the problem of execution right where i worked with multiple industries but now i feel that uh, at this stage in in the career uh, it almost feels like if you're creating a lot of impact right in terms of the kind of companies that you support are they the companies that you would typically be personally very excited about so that you know you feel that you played a role in in developing those companies like agnikul could be or chakra could be so you feel excited about uh, doing that uh, on a day to day basis and the advantage i have as an investor is that i don't necessarily have to stick to one problem right so in the morning i can work with one set of entrepreneurs who are working on a very different project in the evening with a different different set so my um, sort of success is more around having that freedom to be able to sort of work on things that you really that you care about right so you're financially stable you are family stable and what not right professionally stable so now you have all the freedom to be able to sort of do what you want to do and a lot of people would define it in the sense that uh, eventually it comes down to freedom back early retirement what not right i think it's the same thing that you have the freedom to do what you want to do uh when you want to do great so that's a great definition freedom to do what you want to do and when you want to do it <laughs> thank you so much uh, for answering all those questions so very patiently and it was really an amazing session something very different uh, good exposure for all of our students and faculty thank you so much i'll hand it back to the compares now thank you so much may i now request student manager ankita jani to deliver the vote of thanks Thank you, Malvika. It gives me an immense pleasure to deliver the vote of thanks to Mr. Ankur Srivastava Sir. I, Ankita Dhyani, on behalf of SBUP family, all the directors, faculty members, and my fellow student managers of Sri Balaji University, Pune, extend a deep gratitude to our honourable guest speaker, Mr. Ankur Srivastava Sir, who has taken his valuable time from his busy schedule and honoured us with his presence to interact with all of us. so we had a lot of learnings from your session but some of the key learnings from your session were how we got a broad exposure of what investors think and how is market working for investors and why tech companies are increasingly becoming the most valuable creating business in the long term globally and how investors need to have tech stocks in their portfolio to make strong returns and how we budding student entrepreneurs need to think and work on it and always be ready with plan b in our life ahead so we thank you for being with us and for being a part of the marketing symposium 2021 organized by biology institute of modern management biml it has been a privilege listening to you we have gained a lot from you so and we look forward to many more interactions with you off as well as on the campus thank you so thank you so much yes yes malvika you can continue okay. i now request professor sopnil udge department of operations to present a token of gratitude to our guest ankur shivastava sir yes uh, good afternoon ankur sir i would like to thank you for such an enriching session on behalf of students directors faculty members and all the all the staff of sri balaji university pune it was a great learning experience for all of us sir as we got new insights from the investors perspective as a token of gratitude on behalf of the entire bimm family uh, uh, we would like to present you with this book titled genius makers by kade mills Uh, which talks about the mavericks who brought artificial intelligence to google facebook and the entire world the book will reach you in a couple of days sir thank you once again sir for such an enriching session over to you campers thank you sir thank you so thank you very much uh, ankur and uh, hope to see you again hope to interact with you again thank you so yeah. much for your time Thank you so much. Yeah, I'll see you all later. Bye. Thank you.